welcome to episode 298 of Late Night Linux, recorded on the 9th of September 2024. I'm Joe, and with me are Graham. In the bleak midwinter. <laughs> Will. I wonder who got the power pack. <laughs> and Poppy. Hello! Or is it Alan? I can never decide. Yes. So thank you for standing in for failing while he is sunning himself somewhere sunny. I hope he has his lotions. <laughs> He'll be indoors. He will be, sheltering from the uh, big ball in the sky. But anyway, yes, people may know you from Linux Matters at linuxmatters.sh. We should definitely plug that at the beginning here. Yes, also, sign up to my newsletter. <laughs> <laughs> Your ideas are intriguing to me. <laughs> yeah, I'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. Thanks. Right, let's do some news then. Microsoft has donated Mono to the Wine Project. I don't really know what it means to donate an open source project to another open source project, but Microsoft have done it. Is it throwing the code over the wall because they don't want to look after it anymore, basically? Well, they stopped looking after it a while ago, didn't they? There's a long story arc with this, isn't there? Because didn't was it Miguel de Casa create Mono before all of this mm. to re-engineer .NET, C Sharp? And it was successful at the time we were able to run .NET stuff on Linux. And then Xamarin, his company, was acquired by Microsoft. So then it went into Microsoft's fold. And then I guess it's been, that was a tacit acknowledgement, I suppose, of Microsoft that Mono was helpful. It was open source. And then I think a lot of .NET has become open source. Or should I say, the last time I looked, C Sharp .NET in Microsoft's application service ecosystem and its visual programming and its database interfaces has just become part of its whole thing so you you need a subscription basically to use it so maybe .NET and mono as a project has become somewhat redundant and so they're throwing mono to wine i'm still a bit bitter about the whole history of mono because there were some rather nice applications that i used to quite enjoy and Two of them shipped by default on Ubuntu mm. for years, FSpot, the photo manager, and mm. Tomboy, the note-taking app. And there was also Banshee, the music player, which was awesome. And they were all written with slash in mono or csharp.net, whatever you want to call it. And they were all free software, but some people just had a real beef with the fact that Microsoft were the originator or you know were linked to this mono project, despite it being a fully free software project, they thought that Microsoft would come in and take their ball away and claim patent rights over all this software, which never happened. They were wrong. And so a lot of those applications got forcibly kicked out of distros and it kind of demotivated a bunch of developers. And there were other problems, technological problems as well. But I found it very frustrating that people seemed so negative about Mono. I remember F-Spot, and it was a really good application. And I don't think it ever got replaced by anything that was quite as good as it. Right. And it was just for ideological reasons, which didn't matter in the end. So frustrating. Same for Banshee. Like, Banshee has features that aren't even in most music players. There's a, a feature that can do, like, dynamic playlists, where it figures out the ratings that you give songs and how often you play them. And builds you a playlist of songs you like it's not just ones you've clicked heart on or whatever it's it's more dynamic than that and uh none of the modern music players have that and tomboy was great as well i used to really love tomboy in fact i helped maintain a ppa for uh for tomboy for a while and so you know i was quite a regular daily user in fact i went and downloaded it again to have a look at it and there were other forks of it or re-implementations there was g note that was written in c plus plus that you know sought to replace tomboy and then there's tomboy ng which is rewritten again in lazarus pascal and uh yeah so i downloaded one of the old releases of ubuntu 1804 and uh apt installed tomboy to have a bit of fond memories today and uh yeah it's still pretty rock solid so is Wine the new Apache in terms of places old software goes to die? I wonder if there's some logic in some old game setup or something related to what Wine already maintains is still needed in terms of the .NET translation. So Mono may be actively kind of supported. But certainly when you install some applications, you know, you have to go and mm. install a whole bunch of other stuff, whether it's like fonts or C++ runtime DLLs. And the mono, like .NET runtime stuff is often 
something you install, maybe that'll all get built in and made auto magic now because you won't need to then go and find this stuff or use things like wine tricks to install it. Is Mono still, you, or rather C Sharp, still used a lot on Windows? I have a reference point of one. I have um, a good friend who's programmed in C Sharp his whole life, and it, it, at least in the Microsoft world, it seems to be just as big as ever. It's mm. the default kind of... I don't want to say scripting language because he he wouldn't speak to me again, but it seems to be uh, <laughs> the default kind of way for lots of mid-level kind of development work, connecting to lots of Microsoft's APIs and tooling. So it, it's still relevant in the overall ecosystem. The chances of there being a new Linux app developed in it are small, but not zero. But it might give you access to a whole host of other applications that exist out there. I think so. I think that's probably right. Yeah, or APIs at least. The way I usually measure how popular things are is look at GitHub trending. I know that is not good because it's only like open source stuff and only open source stuff that people have put on GitHub. But you can see the number of stars that some of the projects have got because you can filter it by language. And so if you filter by C Sharp, you can see stuff in there that has thousands of stars and thousands of forks so somebody's doing something with this stuff oh i just had a look at github there and the top project written in c sharp is jellyfin so the answer to my question is yes Mm. there's definitely a lot of stuff out there right a lot of relevant stuff interesting the internet archive lost its appeal over ebook lending shock horror (laughs) So this was a decision from the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. Now, this all started years ago when the Internet Archive started scanning books and then lending them out to people digitally, where they would only let people borrow these books if they had the physical copy of it. So say they had five physical copies of the book, that means that five people at once can borrow that book and no more. And they got away with this for quite a long time. But then... COVID happened. Libraries all shut down, physical ones. And so they stepped up and basically just said, it's fine, we'll just relax that rule. Well, the publishers didn't like that and have gone after them. And then so over the last four and a bit years, there's been various back and forth. And now it's looking like they've basically lost. And this is really, really bad news for the Internet Archive. They keep doing this, though. They keep pushing the boundaries of copyright intentionally and so you know maybe claiming fair use or claiming that they're within the boundaries of what it should be applicable in in copyright law and at some point you know some bigger boys will come along and tell you no that's actually not the case and take you to court and it's happened and i'm not remotely surprised by this i don't think anyone should be because this was going to happen at some point. There's like so much copyrighted material on the Internet Archive. Yeah, rightly or wrongly, whatever your perception of how right or wrong the current copyright law is in the US and the rest of the world, they are arguably breaking the rules. And therefore, it's not surprising at all that they lost. But what they were doing in the first place was quite reasonable, I think, and most people thought, and it kind of flew under the radar because they were having this rule of, you know, the equivalent physical copies to what they were lending out. And it was only when they broke that rule that the shit hit the fan. And if they had not done that, I think that the lawsuits would have not happened. Right. And that's what normal libraries, like, you know, the brick and mortar library that you can sign up to, that a lot of them have got apps that you can download books like Libby and others, and you can only borrow what they've got. If you want to borrow a book that somebody else has borrowed, just like a physical book, you can't have it until they, in inverted commas, bring it back. And so I can see why that was perceived as okay, because that's what libraries do. But now by pushing this boundary, they have fucked it up, and now they can't even do what they were doing in the first place. That has now been shut down. Indeed. Well done. So why did they do that? Well, that's what they do. They push boundaries. They're they're constantly pushing boundaries. The archive is full of old 8-bit retro games and full PC operating systems. There's a whole trove of stuff in the Internet Archive that arguably shouldn't be there. That's abandonware. It's fine. There's no such thing as abandonware. (laughs) And so it's not surprising. They fucked around and they found out. Yeah, unfortunately. 
It seems to me that they offer a valuable service, which the publishers obviously would like not to happen, and Amazon and people like that would like it not to happen. But I think if you ask people, then they genuinely want a service like this where they can get access to a whole bunch of material without physically leaving their house. And that's good for a a million and one reasons. So how can somebody offer a service like this in a legal way? I don't know if they ever can. And that's, I guess, to Popey's point, why they're pushing the boundaries here to, to try and get people to think, well, if we're not doing it, who is going to do it? And if the answer to that is nobody, then maybe somebody should try and solve that. But I don't see it ever getting solved, which is a real shame because next time there's a pandemic and the libraries all close and nobody can get access to anything, we're all going to be bored. Write our own books, I suppose. Okay, this episode is sponsored by people who support us with PayPal and Patreon. Go to latenightlinux.com slash support for details of how you can support us too. Patreon supporters have the option to listen to episodes without ads like this. And it's not just this show. There's two and a half admins about system administration, Linux Matters for upbeat, family-friendly adventures, Linux After Dark for silly challenges and philosophical debates, Linux Dev Time about developing with and for Linux, Hybrid Cloud Show for everything public and private cloud, and Ask the Hosts for off-topic questions from you. You can even get some episodes a bit early. We've got a lot going on, and it's only possible because of the people who support us. So, if you like what we do, and can afford it, it would be great if you could support us too, at latenightlinux.com slash support. All right, let's shit on Mozilla again. So, choose how you want to navigate the web with Firefox. Okay, that's a reasonable blog post title. And, you know, they go through this, blah, blah, blah. And then, oh no, what this is about is adding the likes of ChatGPT to Firefox, building in ChatGPT, Gemini, Hugging Chat, and some others. For now, this is just in the nightly version, and I've tried it out, and it actually works reasonably well. So you can, for example, select a load of text on a web page, right-click, and then get ChatGPT to do some stuff for you, summarize it, create a nice quiz for you. Like I went to our website, selected all the text about the various shows, and said, make me a quiz. And uh, so it, it made me a quiz like, uh, which late night Linux show is about developing for Linux? And it gave me multiple choice. And I was like, I think that might be Linux dev time. And it said, yes, well done, gold star. <laughs> so it, this is really useful. And uh, so I was only joking about shitting on. Uh, <laughs> I think this is excellent. They should definitely do more of this. Thank God we can say this without anyone arguing against us. Because, yeah, <laughs> I agree with you. This is one of the best things Mozilla has done to Firefox. My phone is ringing. Hang on. I think it's. <laughs> I think it might be failing. If the answers it gives aren't the truth at the time that it gives them, they soon will be. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It'll be fine. Are you saying this, Graham, with your um, professional open source expert hat on or your pub landlord making a <laughs> quiz hat on? <laughs> yes, yes, I am. One of the problems that Firefox has is becoming irrelevant. They seem to worry that they will become irrelevant if they don't do a lot of these things, like all the pocket and all the other nonsense over the years. But this one, you know, because so many organizations, even like the big ones that have devices in everyone's home, all have something of this ilk built in. And I guess they're going to feel like they're going to be I don't know, like the Linux desktop and be a tiny, tiny market share and be missing features that literally everyone else has. And no one wants. No one fucking wants these features. That's not true. That's patently not true because there are plenty of people who use this. I see a lot of support questions where people ask, how do I do this thing? I've already asked you know, whatever bot, chatty jeeps or whoever. And they told me this. And it seems to be a default move. Like the youth are using it a lot as well. And it's baked into things like Discord that they all use. And it's baked into their browser and it's baked into the OS on their device. If you don't have this, I suspect Mozilla think you are going to be irrelevant and nobody will use you at all. Well, it's funny you said that they'll end up like the Linux desktop. That's a good thing. For some people, yes, but for people who want to develop certain things or work in certain environments, no, the Linux desktop is not good enough. And I can see why you would want to not be the 4%. 
you would want to be the 94% or whatever Mac OS has, probably about 4% as well. But you'd want to be the desirable one that people actually want, not the also ran that is missing chunky features. I'm not saying I believe this. <laughs> I'm, I'm very clearly articulating what I think Mozilla want, which is not be cast into the dustbin of irrelevance. But by doing this, they risk exactly that. If they took a stand and said, no, we're not adding this bullshit to our browser, people would love that. Okay, it might be just a few sweaty nerds on Mastodon, but those are the kind of people who will use it and support it. Like It's fine for Firefox to be a bit smaller, to be the also ran, like the Linux desktop. Mm. That's what I'm saying. Like, that's what I want. Sure. That's fine. If that's what you want, that's that's great. But what you want doesn't pay the bills at Mozilla. No. And like we talked about a couple of weeks ago, they're probably going to lose the Google money soon. And so they're going to have to be a somewhat smaller organization. Yeah. Or have other paid services, whether that's a paid chatty jeeps or integration with other things that have subscription service that they can scrape a little bit out of they're going to have to do something to stay relevant well when i tried this chat gpt baked in to firefox in the nightly it kept hassling me to upgrade to the premium version of course now i would be quite surprised if mozilla are not going to get a kickback of that if i do sign up for the premium version yes i would imagine they would but they've pissed a lot of people off with this already and it's not even in the main browser yet it's just in the fucking nightly i would love to see the web stats for chat gpt hugging face chat thing google gemini and all the others and see what the browser agents are and i would be willing to bet there's a fair number of firefox users who are not you and not me and not us nerdy linux types who want an independent browser but I suspect there's a lot of people out there who do use this stuff. So the nobody wants this thing is probably provably wrong. And in fact, Mozilla will know how many people are downloading their Olama images, which they make. They know what user agent those people are coming from. And they know how many downloads are coming from Firefox. And so they know there is a desire for people who use Firefox, who isn't you and isn't me, that want this thing. But I don't want it, so therefore no one does. Of course, of course. Just like Rust and Mono and everything else, it's all culture clash and conflict. I quite like the way that we have Alan here to be a devil's advocate. A bit anti failure <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, my experience, and I'm sure we've all had the same experience, is that the quality is just not there in what we're calling the AI responses. In fact, it's got so bad with Gemini and Google searches that I kind of avoid it like the plague and like will even click to the second page of results to not even clutter my brain with whatever Gemini is suggesting because it's demonstrably wrong in certain places when you're asking for certain queries. And I think that's what Joe is saying. And I agree. I don't feel like we should be, as a community, promoting something that just delivers what people want but isn't exactly what they need. God, is that is that a Coldplay lyric? <laughs> <laughs> and I worry about it. I mean, we've got kids and you're talking about them using AI in their social media, and they do. And I am increasingly having to correct them or get into stroppy parent arguments about saying, no, that's actually wrong. That's misinformation. And you need to find another source for information. And that's what worries me about this as well. I think part of the problem with that is the free versions of all of these are crippled and they're either based on old data or old algorithms or old models. The newer ones tend to be better. You know, stuff improves over time as it does with technology. And some of the newer paid versions are even better. Like, you know, they can actually just write you a program or write you a game or write you a function that you're missing or answer a tricky question depending upon how you word it. And it does mean that a lot of people turn into, I'm sorry, I'm having to say this, prompt engineers. Like they find the right question to ask in order to get the right answer. And a lot of the free versions of all of these tools are shit, but the paid ones are often a lot better. They're not perfect. They don't give the right answer every time, but they're newer based on newer models, have better data sources. By better, I mean like they've scraped more data. 
And so they are better. And so it's difficult to agree that they are all wrong and they're all terrible and they're all bad when if the people who are measuring them are the people who don't like them and so will never pay for them and so only ever use the shit free ones. And so it's inevitable you're going to get a biased answer of these are all shit if you only ever try the shit ones. Thank you for explaining it that way. It makes sense what you're saying. And I have had some good results. But if Mozilla is going to do AI, and I can't believe we're even talking about this, then why can't it be the custodian of properly open source and freely accessible good AI? Well, they are because they made Olama Hmm. and they host a whole bunch of Olama models that you can just go to their GitHub page, download and run. And it's running on your local machine. It's not running, you know, on somebody else's computer. All the interactions you have are on your local host and you can customize it. You can build your own and, you know, you can try those all out. They're all mostly worse than the big ones because they didn't have billions of pounds worth of NVIDIA GPUs behind them, unfortunately, but they they are doing some of that. That yeah, you know, Mozilla does sponsor those those free to use and ethically sourced, shall we say? Yeah, you know, arguably not ethical because of the amount of compute that they use and water for cooling and so on and so on. Just to keep Phelium happy, let's do a bit of KDE stuff. There's a post by Nate asking for donations in Plasma. So on the Plasma desktop, every year in December, there's going to be a notification pop up asking you to donate. Some people are not hugely happy about this, but I am very much in favor of it. I think, yes, do it. Do it every six months. It should be monthly. I I think it should definitely be more often than a year. That's far too long. Signal spams me more often than that. And I hate Signal. (laughs) And, you know, that thing pops up a little thing with a please donate. And back on the Ubuntu podcast, we interviewed Kovi Goyal, who made Calibre, the ebook reader. He makes a ton of money out of that. He's got a gigantic donate button on the toolbar at the top of his app. Now, part of the reason why he makes a lot of money out of that is because they're mostly Windows users who have no other option. There is no other ebook app, or there wasn't when he first created it. And so he cornered the market and people like it. And so they press the button. There's a big button at the top. I think all applications that are free software should manage to put this in somewhere. And I mentioned that on Mastodon when this came out and people started moaning at me, oh, it's going to be nagware now, is it? I'm like, yes, yes, it is. Get your wallet out and pay them, you cheap ass fuckers. Go and pay them some money. Yeah, well, with this being KDE, of course, there's an option to disable it. Of course, there's an (laughs) option. Well, you can recompile the software and remove the feature completely if you really want to. I don't think there should be an option to disable it. It should be punch you in the face until you give them some money. You sound like Bob Geldof now. (laughs) Yes. I'm not going to try and do the Irish accent, but yes. (laughs) They mentioned in passing that they took some inspiration from Wikipedia, or rather they didn't take inspiration from Wikipedia because they think it's too in your face. But the Wikipedia one seems to come in fits and starts. Like I seem to get it sometimes every month, sometimes once a year. It doesn't really seem to make sense. But... I still maintain this relationship with Wikipedia where I think I'm getting value from it and the world would be worse without it. And so I pay the money. And I think that Plasma are in exactly the same position, that they deserve to be paid and so people should. Yeah. I went to FOSDEM last year and as I walked around, I stopped off at the organisation that pays for Let's Encrypt, CertBot and all that stuff. Mm. And I said, oh, I use your stuff. And he said, oh, do you know how we're funded? And I was like, no. He goes, Donations. And he explained how they're funded. And he said, would you like to donate? I was like, yeah, of course, because I've got mm. certificates up the wazoo. Yeah. And uh, I got a little gift and then I got an email and I donated again recently. And I didn't even know that I could donate to them. I didn't look into it. But when the guy explained it, I was like, oh, yeah, I probably should. Mm. Yeah, that's the thing. A lot of people don't know that they can. And Thunderbird did this as well. They asked for donations and they got a shitload and they were able to hire a bunch of people. So, yeah, very much in favour of it. I think the key will be in making it as straightforward as possible. You won't like this, but if I'm browsing a website and it's got uh, to buy something and it's got an Apple Pay option and I'm on my Apple phone, I will more often than not complete that purchase because it's so easy. If they can make it as easy as Apple Pay, for example, in the desktop, that's going to get them a lot more money. Right, well, we'd better get out of here then. 
Thank you very much for joining us, Popey. It's been great. Thanks very much. Please subscribe to my newsletter. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, well done with the plugs. We'll be back next week when there'll be all sorts of interesting stuff. But until then, I've been Joe. I've been Graham. I've been Will. I've been Popey. See you later.